you wait for order, um, Dr. Walker is uh, going to lead us in a prayer. Pledge. Thank you. Uh, and we invite you to join us. Almighty God, we thank you for the privilege of serving our fellow men and women through our positions here at ECUA. We thank you that we live in a democratic society in which we can practice democratic government. We ask you to bless our proceedings today and help us to make, a wise, make wise decisions. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Thank you, Dr. Walker. Um, the next item is the adoption of the agenda. Uh, would anyone like to move the agenda? Mr. Perkins? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any additions, corrections, whatever? Uh, if not, please vote. And it passes 5-0. Uh, the sole purpose of our meeting today is the executive director search. And this part of our agenda is to uh, have interviews with the individual candidates before the full board. We, this morning, interviewed the candidates individually. Um, and we had a nice meet and greet at noon. And now it's time for the public to be involved in and kicking the tires and, and seeing the candidates themselves. I think we'll probably invite them up, unless there's an objection, one by one for questions, and we'll do it alphabetically. So uh, Mr. Palmer will be the first one. I don't see Don. Hmm. Yes. If I may, I believe the order that was published on the schedule was reverse alphabetical order. So oh, okay. it was Warden, that's fine. Woody, and Palmer. At the okay, that's fine. It's just not on my agenda right here, so that's fine. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. So we're, we're doing in reverse alphabetical order. Did you wish to address us at all, Mr. Benziger? I, d I really don't think I have anything to add. Colin Benziger, Colin Benziger and Associates, it's been a long process and hopefully it'll come to conclusion today. Okay. Got three great candidates. We'll see what happens. Okay, thank you. And you're here for our questions. Mr. Johnson. Uh, yes, ma'am. I, I believe that uh, as per, per prior uh, go round that we asked the other candidates to leave the room. Uh, for each interview. Okay. So if Mr. Woody would. Uh, no, Warden. Warden. Warden first. Well, Woody Warden would lead the room. First. We'll ask Mr. Woody to lead. Uh, I believe Tim was ready to escort him. He's already, He's already gone? Okay. All right. Good. I'm sorry. Good. Good. Um, okay. Then, Mr. Warden, if you will come forward. Sorry for the confusion. Afternoon. I, I, I can only go to A to Z. I don't do backwards. <laughs> I, my, my mother, <laughs> I'm sorry to do this, but she grew up on a farm in the Depression, and she couldn't wait to go to school. So the first day of school, she wanted to learn to read, and she looked at the alphabet, but no one had ever told her that it was left to right. So she learned the alphabet from Z to A. She can say it just like that. <laughs> I needed her help today. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. If you would like to just introduce yourself and say a few words, and then we'll open it for questions. Well, good afternoon. My name is Rodney Warden. Um, I have spent uh, most of my career in the Naval Service, serving in the Civil Engineer Corps. Uh, and then for the last three years, I've been running a water and wastewater utility uh, for the County of Lake, which is just north of Chicago. Okay, and we will now open it to questions from the members of the board. Mr. Perkins. Well, a lot of, a lot of your experience is, is military and they've got like a chain of command and people follow orders when you, when you give them to them and stuff. And when you're in working in an elected capacity, 
you know, sometimes it's like herding cats trying to get things done. You've got people with different agendas. You've got outside forces. You've got inside forces with staff. You've got special interests. You've got citizen input. How do you how do you see yourself being able to manage all that, all that type of chaos? Well, so a, a couple of things on that front. One, I would like to uh, highlight that within the Navy structure. Um, it's not like the movies. It, it's not the, uh, the commander saying, charge, follow me. Um, uh, in, in my specialty within the Navy, it's civil servants who are performing the work, uh, very similar to state employees, or in this case, the utilities employees. And it's very much of a team approach. And uh, at the end of the day, there does need to be leadership to make the decisions and, and continue the momentum forward. But it has to be through a consensus building process. Um, now, there has been a transition as I uh, left the Navy and, and joined a, you know, the county organization. I have 21 board members who have varying different uh, viewpoints on things. And um, uh, then also, we, we uh, in my current utility, we are in uh, a, a patchwork of a network of uh, support services with municipalities. And so I work with mayors and city managers. And again, uh, all having competing interest and priorities, and we work through that. Um, you know, it's just collaboration and over communication to, to get to success. And Ms. Campbell, your light is on, but I want to follow up on what Mr. Perkins said, because I asked you something very similar today when we talked, and I said something about the top-down structure of the military. And you gave me an interesting answer about how you see decision making and, and change making in our organization. Do you remember that? Well, I do. And uh, one of the things that we've implemented in the um, Lake County utility that I think um, there's an opportunity to, to, to bring to this setting as well is employee committees. And so we've established an employee committee uh, basically for good ideas. We call it Fix What Bugs You. And it has representation from all of our divisions. And those employees are uh, an entry point for ideas from other employees. And then it gets vetted, and good ideas come from that. A couple of examples are um, we, they, the old process was everybody had to drive to a center point to, uh, to refuel vehicles. They were wasting over a half an hour to drive to the, <coughs> to the location and back. And we were able, through their recommendations, come into agreements with two municipalities. And we now have local fueling at each of our um, water reclamation facilities, uh, which is a great step forward. And the other one was they were highlighting and proud of a GIS system that we have in place, but when they were in the field, they couldn't access it. And so now we have tablets for everybody. Um, and those were good ideas that came from the employees. We also have a safety committee made up of um, frontline employees, and um, our capital improvements program also is made up of our um, employees to help provide that additional perspective to how we're making our decisions. Thank you. Ms. Campbell. So um, I love that you have experience with the Navy because we're a Navy town. But uh, And I also love that your father lives in Milton because, you know, if you have other offers, we'll be dangling dad over <laughs> here. But uh, I hope I didn't scare you off with all, all my questions today. I fed you my issues, and I think you think very good on your feet. You're a solution-driven person. We used to be a sleepy little town here in Pensacola, but the economic development um, cork, per se, is out of the out of the bottle, and I don't think there's any way to put it back in. Um, you explained to me about your permit inter interference interface person mm -hmm. um, that helps your organization move in that with that economic development arm in mind. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Right. So. Um we had the problem that uh, some of our development customers were getting surprised late in the process. And so they would come in and uh, get an understanding of what was expected of them. And then 10 months later in the process, uh, there would be things that um, uh, staff would just say, well, of course you have to do this extra step. It's not an extra step. It's just a step in the process. But we were surprising people, and they were getting frustrated. And so uh, we uh, implemented two things on that front. One, we now have a permit assist visits. So the first time that somebody comes in to the department, we have a checklist. We sit down with them. We explain the process, the timelines that are typically associated with that, and what we can do to partner with them to expedite uh, if there's a need to expedite. But we also converted a position 
that used to just kind of do special projects, and we reinvented that position so it wasn't a growth in, in uh, manpower. But we have a part-time person who is our permit manager. And so they basically shepherd the, per the permits as it goes through the process and, and make sure that the customers are getting feedback and making sure that things aren't getting hung up in the system. And if I might, so that, sure. just continue, so that your really good high-paid engineers aren't stuck in a... Right, and so, so this, is, this is a non-engineer position, but somebody who's been trained in our processes and um, at first our engineers were a little reluctant to give up what they thought might be loss of control of the process because uh, in the old model each engineer was given a set of permits and they would manage it as best they could even though it had to go through other departments in the um, in the county uh, but now that we have that person the engineers are able to focus on when it's when it's time for them to actually do the engineering review and I mean we're paying them a premium because of their knowledge base and we're now able to leverage that um, uh, their skills more directly. Thank you very much. Dr. Alexander. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Warden. It was uh, a pleasure to talk with you not too long ago. And uh, uh, one question I didn't ask you, during your tenure in the Navy, did you ever spend any time here in Pensacola by I chance? I did. So in the late 70s, I served as two years as the operations officer for the Public Works Department here at Naval Station. Okay. All right, all right, a couple of questions here, sure. uh, if you don't mind. Uh, I grew up here in the 60s, and, which was a wonderful time, especially it relates to music, and uh, early 70s as well. Uh, so it, you, know, just, you just heard my colleague state, uh, this community is growing, and uh, it's growing in a way that I think we all feel very good about, and of course the responsibilities that come with that and how then the role of ECUA and the responsibilities of the people that we service throughout this region uh, is so critically important. So we're, you know, we're no longer that little small sleepy town. Uh, we're a community that's moving into quite rapidly into the 21st century, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but a couple of things I want to, that I myself and I, and I certainly do believe my colleagues here uh, have a great deal of concern about, and I think it's of interest to all of us, but not in just sharing that with us, but also for the public who have an opportunity to hear you here today. Uh, but two things I know, and <clears throat> having been on this board a very, very short period of time, is that customer service is huge mm -hmm. in terms of how we respond to our citizens, to the public, and I want to hear a little bit from you. Actually, I want to hear a lot of bit from you around your philosophy around customer service, how you see it, how you understand it. And as we use emerging technology and find ways of engaging the community more, I think we talked about a few of these things, uh, how would you employ maybe some of your ideas into this community? That's the first question. Second question, I think we all have a great deal of concern for is also diversity uh, because we live in a very diverse community here. It certainly is much more diverse than what it was when I grew up here 40, 50 years ago. Uh, and we want to have an ECUA throughout the ranks of the entire organization from the bottom right up to the top uh, that demonstrates uh, and role model diversity and embraces it uh, in a holistic kind of way not something that we do because we got to do it, we do it because it's the right thing to do. And as you and I talked about this morning, uh, having a diverse population of people throughout the organization is how we gain new ideas and how we grow and how we really show how great and good we really are. So I would like for you to speak, if you would, to those particular items. And if you can, even share and demonstrate some examples of how you have employed those types of things throughout your career, uh, if you will. So I'll start with diversity, um, especially at Lake County where I have uh, more control. In the Navy, there are Navy systems and you, you, you manage to those enterprise solutions. But in Lake County, we're able to be a little more innovative and a little more uh, piloting of our own um, ideas. So um, it, it's a common challenge and certainly one that we have been working on uh, at Lake County. 
Uh, part of it is, well, first is acknowledging and championing the value of diversity and making sure that everybody on the team has the same appreciation for what different perspectives bring to uh, solutions. And, um, and what we found is that there was a lot of unconscious bias that people just, it, it wasn't in the forefront of their thinking that when they were making assignments to projects that you know, they were going to people, they, always, they were always going back to the same people who had succeeded in the past and maybe not giving the same opportunities to folks. When we were recruiting, the, the initial response was, well, our candidate pool is just not diverse. It's just, you know, we, we throw the advertisement out there, this is the candidate pool we're getting. And not understanding that there are things that we can do to proactively create the candidate pool. And so uh, some examples that we did, we were in partnership with um, the workforce development arm of the county, and they um, are an extension of efforts to have opportunities for people that come from disadvantaged communities. And so we found that some of the way we were um, writing our position descriptions, we had prerequisite requirements that really weren't foundational to the position. And so we were able to create entry-level positions that as long as you had aptitude for mechanical systems, then we would train you and, uh, and, and then of course you have to retain. But, but we would do that. Um, on the professional level, we changed the, um, where we did our recruiting or advertising for our engineers. When I arrived, we had um, seven engineers, all white, one female. And today, I'm proud to say that we have two females, one of which is our supervisor, and we have two minorities uh, on board. So uh, meaningful progress, um, and, uh, but it's a continuing effort. It's not a, a one and done. And once you have the, the, the people uh, uh, as part of the team, you really do have to look at retention and making sure that, that it's a, an environment where everybody has equal opportunity to succeed. For customer service, it, it, to me, the key is creating a sense of ownership. When that call comes in and somebody has a concern, they either don't understand their, their bill or they're frustrated because um, uh, you know, something's gone wrong with their service, making sure that there is a sense of empathy when you're talking to the customer and making sure that they understand the situation because they might just have, they normally don't think about water and wastewater or sanitation until they have a problem, making sure they understand the process. But often the problem needs to be handed off to somebody else to, to, to solve. And so there has to be a process to where somebody is tracking that, that trouble call to make sure that the feedback is getting back to the employee. Um, you know, to me, it would be a system breakdown if you're getting calls from the customers, unless you have a personal relationship with them and they're just calling you because they know you. But um, it would typically mean that the customer has tried to, to come in the front door and gotten some sort of a roadblock and now they're looking for an alternative solution. And so, you know, we would need to look at the process to make sure that there's feedback coming back to them. I mean, there are gonna be many times where we have to say no or explain that that's just a limitation of our services. But there's a way to do that to where people can have a better understanding of why that limitation is there and feel that we care. Um, if there's time, there's sure. <laughs> um, and then also we're, we're leveraging technology. And so we, um, at, at Lake County, we recently implemented a new um, uh, automated telephone system to where um, we can now get real-time reports out of our metering system that will send our customers text, email, and voicemail to say, you have unusual water activity. We really recommend that you walk around your house and look and see if you have a leak. And uh, prior to this, and this is a recent thing for us, but prior to that, we would send you a, a postcard. And so a week later, you would get a postcard. You might or might not read it. And then at the end of the month, you'd get your $500 water bill. Well, then you'd pay attention, and, but you know, it, it was a little bit too late. So, so now we have automation. Now, it's too soon. I can't tell you if getting a text from a utility uh, is going to prompt um, all customers to take action, but I will feel better that the customer had actionable information um, 
in time to, to do something about it. Ms. Campbell. Fantastic question. Um, you interviewed very well, which is important to me because in this position, you're, you're the face. You would be the face of, of the ECUA. Um, have you worked in that capacity where you are now, and how does that go, with, go for you now? I have. Um, so both in the Navy and um, in my current position, um, I'm comfortable in this setting. Um, I report to a public works um, committee. I'm also, uh, in some times, I'm on the other side of the, 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 the setup. I'm, I, I serve on several technical boards. I'm on a school board. So I'm, I'm, I understand the dynamic and the challenges uh, that are presented from, from both of those communities. Um, I've represented the county at, at mayor, municipal leagues, and, and those types of things. Have you worked under the sunshine? Sunshine law. Well, not the sunshine law. Illinois does have a parallel law. Uh, it's not as um, prohibitive of, of communication as the sunshine law is, but I'm familiar with the concept and the challenges that that presents. Many challenges. Dr. Walker. Mr. Warden, um, we're here on the Gulf Coast. I just read uh, recently that uh, one a group concerned with climate change is predicting a th three foot increase in sea levels by the end of this century. End of this century admittedly is a long way off, mm -hmm. but uh, sooner or later, Pensacola, like other communities on the co on coast, is going to have to begin thinking about responding to this future problem. Uh, this future problem is worsened by the fact that climate change is also predicted to cost in the U.S. hundreds of billions of dollars in lost revenues for an additional cost for local governments and state governments, uh, which will make it harder to respond later on. Have you had any experience with resiliency planning? Uh, I, I think the Navy would probably not be behind too many groups in, in this because most of your bases, I suppose, are close to uh, our own seacoast. Yes. So uh, perhaps you could get, tell us a bit about your experiences with the issue, that matter of uh, climate change re related resilience planning. Yep, so you, you're, you're correct. Uh, the Navy is spending millions of dollars on both assessing and then doing initial mitigation to what we can do. So looking at both sea level and also uh, severe weather events. So whether that's uh, localized flooding or hurricanes, um, so not just sea level rise, but, but all of the risk associated with uh, uh, what's happening to the greater environment. Um, at Lake County, we also have, um, uh, while we don't worry about hurricanes in Chicago, we do have uh, a lot of localized flooding and uh, the severity of the rain events is, uh, significantly higher than it was even 10 years ago. We don't have more rain in a given year, but we have more severe weather events in a given year. And so um, it's just about looking at your system and looking at where your vulnerabilities are. Is it elevation? Is it uh, backup um, power systems? Uh, what are those single points of failure that you have to have redundancy uh, to? So that's a, it's, it's taking the long view and getting ahead of it. Um, as you said, this, you know, nationwide, this is billions and billions of dollars. At any given utility, it is millions of dollars. And it's not something you can wait until it is at your doorstep. It, it's, it, it's already at our doorstep. We, we have to be taking action now. I, if, I don't know if I'm going too long. But um, the other thing is, is I think we need to look internally to the utility. What are we doing? to mitigate our impact, our carbon footprint, whether that's LED lighting or that's um, high efficiency pumps, or I know we're using the, the gas vehicles, but I'm sorry, we're using natural gas vehicles, but if, if you're using, if you, you have some uh, traditional petroleum vehicles, can they be hybrids? If we have small passenger vehicles, does it make economic sense to start migrating those to plug in hybrids or full electrics? So, we need to, uh, A, set an example, but also just in, as good stewards of the environment, we need to be doing everything we can do to minimize our impact. 
So I want to talk to you about stewardship uh, here. We, we live in a fabulous community. I'm sorry about the weather when you came, <laughs> but, uh, but you've seen it before. It's a beautiful community, but we're not a rich community. And people do not have a choice. They, they have to have water, sewer, sanitation. And every time we raise their rates, there are a lot of people for whom it is a bit of a hardship um, because they have no choice. On the other hand, we have a crumbling infrastructure that we must tend to, and we must anticipate the future. What is your background in finance, and how will you help us find the right balance of, of taking care of our infrastructure, but also being sensitive to the implications on our ratepayers? So uh, within the Navy construct, they have a standalone enterprise fund just for public works functions and utilities. Uh, and similar at uh, my current uh, position, the, even though it's embedded in the county, it has a standalone enterprise fund. It, it, it exists on the rates established in the services. So I have experience in going through the process of analyzing cost and setting the, um, what, making the recommendations to the boards to um, modify rates or, or, or not. And I think it's important to look at the long view. If you put off major capital projects, they will be more expensive in the future. And you, you need to take a bite out of the apple. You have to be continually pursuing your recapitalization efforts. Um, I am sensitive to, to rate increases. I think that the burden is on the utility to look internal first, see if there are efficiencies that we can gain in operations and or uh, more cost-effective solutions to, to do the recapitalization. And then the burden is on the staff to bring to you options so that the, we shouldn't come to you and say the only option is to rate, raise the rates X percent, but that we should come to you and say, um, there is this recapitalization imperative. We need to do this, but if we're going to do that, we either need to raise rates or we need to reduce services uh, or gain efficiencies in these other areas, and then you can make your informed decision. Can, can you illustrate anything? The military is sort of a different animal in, in this regard, and any experience in Lake County where you've, you've had a real-life experience with making those kinds of balances, finding those balances? Well, we just in 2019, we went to the board and, uh, and got, uh, made a recommendation for a multi-year rate increase. So uh, we have demonstrated that the water ut side of our utility is underfunded. Um, we have not been recapitalizing for a long extended period of time, and we need to, to, to go after it. And so we uh, did come to them and say, even though we recommend that we go to a fairly high number you know, over time, um, we also recommend a, a, a multi-year steady approach to that as opposed to um, something uh, really dramatic in, in any given year. So we did go to them with alternatives to where these were the, the project lists that we think we should, um, we should do. We have a five-year plan of, of here, here are the projects and we, we rank them as the most urgent. And so uh, the board had options to uh, accomplish those projects more quickly or s slower. And they kind of, there, there was a variety of opinion. And at the end, uh, they kind of chose the middle path. And is this an elected board? And what is the makeup of the board? This is an elected board. So the, the total board is 21 members. The Public Works Committee is nine members. OK, OK. Thank you. Dr. Walker. Uh, you tell us that you report to a board of 21 elected officials. Yes. I, uh, I understand why you would consider going elsewhere. <laughs> uh, we have three line agencies, in essence, our, uti our functions, uh, water, wastewater, and, and sanitation. Of those three, which are you least acquainted with and what would you do to educate yourself? Right, so sanitation I am least familiar with. Um, I have no sanitation experience at Lake County and in the military it was limited to contract oversight. The military, the Navy um, outsources uh, sanitation and so part of the 
portfolio of contracts that Public Works administered was the sanitation um, and recycling. So um, that was mostly just normal acquisition and then troubleshooting if, if there was a, a complaint that the, they were unresponsive to. So, um, you know, step one is to get out and see and learn. You know, by all accounts, um, the gentleman who's running sanitation here is one of the nation's best, and I would learn a lot from him. And then in addition, there are seminars and courses and, and things that I uh, will avail myself to to become much more versed in that arena. Dr. Alexander. Yeah, a couple more questions here, uh, quickly if I could. Um, relationships are hugely important, uh, particularly when you have senior managers reporting to you. I'm interested to know as to if you were in this position, how do you establish relationships with your senior management? And equally as important, how do you hold them accountable for results? So forming the relationship is, um, for me, mostly about FaceTime. It's about meeting with them. It's about shadowing them as they, they go through their functions and getting a better understanding of the challenges that they're facing, um, uh, establishing routine um, uh, rhythm of meetings uh, with the right folks. Um, and then the uh, holding them accountable is um, I, I really focus on the annual improvement plan. So in partnership with the directors, I would meet um, and form what they're going to focus on and improve on the next year. And through that process, establish how do we assess whether we're making progress on that? It, what is the metric that we can use? Mm -hmm. Now, I, I do, I, I'm a little cautious of just having strictly hardcore number metrics because sometimes you can manipulate the data and you're not really achieving the underlying uh, improvement they're trying to get to. But, but you have to have something to measure. And so it would be my intent to formulate annual improvement plan initiatives from each of those three divisions and to also come to you on an annual basis and say, here is the departments, or I'm sorry, here is the utilities um, in improvement goals for next year. Uh, it, that's a, a, a drawn out process. I think we need to have 10 year, 20 year horizon uh, goals. I know that one goal here is to migrate off of septic. And so what would that be? Customer service is certainly something of, of interest. So how do we track volume of calls? How many of them result in uh, more than one call? And, and what are the underlying issues there? So there are metrics that, that we can um, field that will help us start to frame and, and understand what our options are. It, 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 you know, it leads to one other question for me in regards to evaluations of a team. Uh, but what is your thought <clears throat> about as an executive director being evaluated by the board? Do you feel there should be some formal assessment process for someone who holds the position of an executive director? And what would that potentially look like? Well, I would certainly solicit and want your feedback. Um, I don't know the mechanics of, of what's in place as far as um, an evaluation uh, and the formality of that. I'm, uh, I haven't given that uh, thought. Okay. In, in my current role, I, uh, I have an annual improvement plan for my department and I report that to the county administrator and to the public works committee and report out on that. They give me informal feedback, but not as a, say, a written assessment. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Okay. That's all the questions sure. I have, Madam Chair. Ms. Campbell. You, you really take a lot of my questions. <laughs> 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 but I like that. Uh, it's one of the questions I asked the last time that we had this was about um, yearly specific performance, you know, goals, not just for you, but for you with your employees. Um, you and I talked a lot about customer centric being more customer centric and more proactive on economic development versus reactive. We did talk a little bit about the specific performance. Um, I just want to remind you in closing that we're dangling dad over here. <laughs> <laughs> so, and thank you very much for making the trip here. Um, I appreciated our time. Thank you. It's been my pleasure.
Mr. Perkins. Yeah, how's the weather up in Lake County this time of year? Well, it's snowing today. <laughs> <laughs> well, seriously, though, I, you know, I know you haven't had a lot of time to review and look at our organization and stuff, but in the short period that you've tried to familiarize, familiarize yourself with us, is there anything you can see that as an organization you think we could do better or show improvement on? Well, first I'd like to go on the positive and say that all of my interaction with the staff has been exceptional. Everybody is professional, everybody is positive. There's clear pride in what they do and what you do collectively. It, it, to, it might, I, I would be stepping into a great um, organization. Uh, the one thing that um, I'd, I would kind of circle back to is um, finding the right process to get the, the frontline employees um, input into how we can improve things. If there's a retention problem, money may be one of the solutions, but there may be other things that the employees could, could share with us that would make their job better. Um, uh, and, and, and so getting, getting that structure in place, I think, would be um, a value to, to the organization. And Mr. Perkins was thinking along the lines I, I was thinking, uh, but I will frame this a little bit differently. I, I don't even pretend to think like an engineer. You know, that's, that's not my world. What gets your juices flowing <laughs> about this job? What, what excites you about this challenge or this position or this community? Mm -hmm. Well, I like the fact that it's a growing community and that the cork is out of the bottle. Um, I'm, I'm not looking for Sleepy Hollow. I'm looking for a dynamic um, community that's, that's, um, that's expanding and excited about its future. Um, and same with the utility. Um, I, I transitioned out of the Navy into um, Lakes Region, I'm sorry, Lakes Region, um, Lake County. Um, in part to get my son into a high school that, that he was familiar with. He was heading into his senior year of high school. It was a, a great fit for the family. Uh, that has been successful. He's now successfully launched into college. And, uh, and I'm candidly looking for an opportunity that allows me to get back into a larger, more dynamic uh, setting similar to what I had um, in the Navy. And this, um, this organization fits that to a T. So both the community and, and the organization scope and responsibilities is directly aligned to what I'm looking for. Thank you. And I see no more lights, so you have successfully gone through the gauntlet. Um, thank you so much. Um, and thank you. It's been a pleasure. Uh, again, everybody's been wonderful, and I appreciate the opportunity. You are clearly thank well quali qualified. Thank you so thank much. You. And I think, Tim, are you going to escort him out? While we're waiting for the next person, can I bring yes, something up? Sure. You know, we've had this phone system failure recently, and the, and the computer system's gone down. We have got to figure out a way to have some sort of operational redundancy for our ratepayers to be able to contact us for services. I don't know if it's having half a dozen cell phones and customer service that we can forward the number to or anything, but can can staff be looking at this for you know before our next board meeting and have some sort of plan for? operational redundancy or resolving this problem because when when people can't get through I mean we provide basic services and we've got to have them get through thank you for bringing that up mr. Perkins yes mr. Johnson uh, I think we totally agree uh, and and John just walked out the door he, he probably did the best to address this but but basically we they were considering even before we had the problem with the internet and phones together uh, about isolating the customer service area from the main uh, phone and, and internet system. Uh, we did not have problems at some of our uh, outlying sites. Uh, so if we treat customer service as essentially another outlying site, then, then our hope is, is that it will not be affected if we have a problem here. Uh, now, if something happens directly to that site, uh, we've got to work on that too. But uh, we're definitely thinking about it, and we will uh, report back and let you know uh, what our options might be. Okay, good. Thank you. 
Okay, and Mr. Woody, if you will come up, um, you are the next to be interviewed, and if you'd like to just say a few things before we ask you questions. First off, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to come back and, and speak with you about this position. It's one that I'm uh, intensely interested in, and uh, as I've mentioned to a few of you, this is a position that uh, I'm particularly drawn to because it's a wonderful marriage of the engineering that I've enjoyed over the course of my entire career and the uh, city management work that I'm doing now, working for a board and accomplishing the goals and objectives of a board in uh, serving the general public. So I uh, hopefully uh, would have an opportunity to perhaps uh, do that for you as well. I'm open to any questions that you might have. Sure. Okay. Who wants to start this off? Ms. Campbell. Second time around. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what, what is it about the job and the location that you like? Um, because, you know, I've, I've enjoyed my time talking with you, and I'd like to hear more about why you, why you like us. Okay. Uh, I like this organization very much because it uh, is uh, utility specific. Over the course of my career, I've provided uh, lots of different services, and uh, wastewater and sanitation have been number one top on my list in terms of services for the general public that I've always enjoyed. Uh, while I've done a little less water than, than the other two, I've done uh, quite a bit of water utility work uh, in the earlier part of my career, and I worked for the city of Olathe, uh, Kansas. As far as uh, this uh, general area, um, well, I don't have uh, family in the immediate, immediate area. My our, um, uh, vacation and visiting um, goals and objectives a as family has always been either um, uh, the southeast um, in the uh, Florida Panhandle area for decades now, uh, or alternatively, we also go to uh, Denver quite a bit. But uh, beautiful uh, community, uh, beautiful part of the state as well. Thank you, and if I might. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you were the only candidate both times that um, provided us with an action plan. Can you touch on that plan and how you plan to make ECUA not only more customer centric, more employee friendly, but easier for other government entities to work with um, over the first 90 days? Thank you. Um, my, my concern for, uh, let, me, let me tell you a story. Um, as a city manager of an organization that has 700 employees, it takes uh, quite a bit to get out and meet everybody, see everybody. Uh, but one day, absolutely, that I'm sure, to always meet a new employee is their first day. I attend all of our new employee orientations and uh, I have a series of questions I usually go through with uh, each of them. I ask their uh, background and whether they've worked in private sector versus public sector. Uh, the purpose for starting that conversation is to get some feedback on and to draw distinctions between the two. If they've come out of the pub private sector, then they're probably already familiar with how uh, customer-centric the private sector is. Uh, in order to keep that customer so you don't lose it to your competitor and how that is the, largely the focus for private sector business. Uh, unfortunately, on the public sector, uh, too many times, whether you're talking about city government, county government, public utilities, et cetera, that doesn't always become the priority, though it should. Just because we have a captured audience, can't easily move away or move or change services to the to a competitor since they're uh, essentially a monopoly. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, there's not enough uh, emphasis put on that customer service aspect. So that's uh, one thing that I always try to drive home with a new employee that we may be a public sector uh, agency and we serve uh, the, the, the general public or a service uh, agency. We need to have that same level of uh, urgency for how we serve the general public as you would more typically find in the, on the private sector. So Mr. Woody, um, you provided us with some references on your uh, application, I do. and I called you references, and I happened to call when your whole city was watching the parade of the C Kansas City Chiefs, <laughs> but what was interesting is they talked to me during this parade because they felt that strongly. 
Um, I have never heard references as glowing as I got from the people whom I spoke to. And, and they told me many things, but one of the things uh, they said was that you have a nine-member council, a mayor Correct, and mayor a council, and, council. and they r run concurrently, so there's not staggered terms, and sometimes they come in to sweep out the existing, and, and one person ran for mayor, and his goal was to get rid of you. True. And, and after the fact, soon after the fact, he said that was the biggest mistake he ever made, and that he is now your biggest fan. He's moved on to the legislature. Yes. Um, uh, you clearly have a way of winning over your council members through your work. Um, how would you work for th with this board? How do you see your experience there translating here? Uh, every every board or council I've ever worked for is always uh, been a concern to me to have uh, good communications and a very good uh, working relationship. And one of the first things that I always uh, state, and I've said a little bit of this to several of you already today, but uh, the concern being that um, your executive director, in my case city manager, and staff are here to provide you with a professional recommendation based on our knowledge, experience, facts and figures, et cetera. And uh, as long as that relationship uh, is such that you uh, are open to receiving that information so you can make the best informed decision that you can, then, I, uh, then I'm very supportive of anything and everything that, that you would ask of us as staff to do once you have to add in the additional factors uh, that you have to take into account, the, the values and priorities and politics sometimes of, of the given community. As long as you're not asking me to do something illegal or unethical, um, I'm on it. And that's something that I, I spend quite a bit of time also talking to our own staff, that they have to respect the fact that not every recommendation is going to be followed because there's factors that they just don't get necessarily. I try to explain what, where I can, but uh, there's a bigger picture even outside our technical uh, recommendation that needs to be accounted for. And I, and I did get that feedback. They, they said you were beyond reproach as far as ethics were concerned. Oh, well, thank and, you. Um, Dr. Alexander. Yes, thank you, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to have had to speak with you earlier. I have a series of questions here, of course, I would like to ask, and, um, and one that is very important, I don't think uh, we should overlook as board members, what, but what information for you, say if you were in this position as executive director, what information do you think is important for board members to be aware of uh, concerning the day-to-day -day operation of the utility board the from day -day your experience. Day-to-day operations. I think broadly that would fall into two categories for me. Uh, one are those regarding uh, the responsiveness of the organization, which I would think would be of almost greatest concern to you. Mm -hmm. Responsiveness is an important value as an elected uh, person in whatever board or uh, community they happen to, to work in. So you being sure that we are receiving whatever feedback you're providing, questions from constituents, be it, and uh, our timely response to those, so those are important communications. <coughs> the others are more of an operational and financial nature um, metrics that uh, equate to uh, our compliance with our environmental permits uh, our ability to meet standards we've set for timeliness and delivery of services, um, missed stops on picking up sanitation um, uh, accounts, uh, those types of uh, odds and ends as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Follow-up, uh, well, not so much follow-up question, but another question I have. How would you go about identifying strengths, weaknesses, challenges, uh, and opportunities, if you will, for improvement in the utility staff and contractors. And once you have identified what those strengths or weaknesses or opportunities may be, uh, how would you potentially go about making those changes? And please feel free to, to 
illustrated experience you may have had in regards to, to that. Okay. Um, let me take one at a time. First, uh, in-house for staff and then separately out of house for contractors. Mm -hmm. um, in-house for staff, uh, kind of a two-part approach. And it varies a little bit about what level of staff you're talking about as well. First off, talking with um, directors. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a firm believer in the need for uh, regular and annual performance appraisals. And those performance appraisals not only have the form of certain relatively objective goals, but also having um, some goals that are, that are associated with the strategic plan of the board. And I always like to uh, include a stretch goal of some kind that might be something a little above and beyond. Maybe it's not the uh, end all if, if it isn't met, but it's something that we're gonna try to do a little above and beyond. Um, that's a mechanism plus the regular feedback and, and meeting with staff that we use to, uh, that I use to um, keep up with uh, individual uh, department directors. <laughs> as far as evaluating further down in the organization and getting feedback from them, uh, the higher up in your organization, uh, the more difficult that is to do. So if you don't have some kind of mechanism, be it through the HR department or otherwise, that you get some kind of feedback loop from the folks that are literally on the front line of the organization, uh, you're either going to get information that's hearsay several times several, as it trickles up through the organization, or you're going to miss opportunities, uh, particularly when you're trying to refine services or trying to find better ways to um, to do things. Those folks that are right there out there on the front line sometimes will have some of the best ideas because they're the ones that are doing it day in, day out. Uh, when it comes to uh, out of house and talking about contractors, uh, their performance is largely uh, evaluated uh, both by the project managers who might be overseeing the individual work or by the operations and maintenance folks who are having to live with the consequences <laughs> of the contractor work. Uh, you know, when you're bidding a project, it's, um, uh, it's not only the uh, low bidder, but it's also the best bidder. And uh, I have a few times in, in past years uh, actually banned some contractors for not meeting that secondary standard or uh, made recommendations for awards to the second low bidder if the first uh, didn't have the proper experience or track record. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, one more question, sure. if you don't mind, Madam Chair. Uh, <clears throat> in your 90-day action plan mm -hmm. uh, under personnel, the very last item there you referred to is you would review the diversity statistics in the workforce and compare the demographics to the ECUA service area. You, you know, if you would, can you expound a little bit on that? What do you mean? And uh, because I want to be consistent in this questioning uh, throughout the course of these interviews. I, I really would like to, not just me, but this board and this community that's listening to this interview today, uh, we certainly want to know how do you, how do you embrace diversity within the workforce itself? Uh, what's your philosophy around it? And as a senior leader, the executive director, uh, if you are in this position, uh, how would you, and I see it here in your 90-day plan, but how do you take it off this page and make it come alive, if you will? Mm -hmm. That's one part of the question. The second piece is customer service, because we all, as we want to know all of these questions, because all of us are in line with each other in terms of what we're trying to do here with this community, but as it relates to customer service, also give us your... Uh, feel understanding of how do you value customer service particular particularly in the role that we all would be playing here as it relates to uh, our our responsibilities our rate our rate payers our customers are our community and if uh, as an organization if we don't uh, represent our community in a favorable way, then we uh, don't earn the um, trust and confidence in our community that we should, quite, quite frankly. 
um, hiring uh, to meet uh, the demographics of a community can be a challenge. Um, sometimes it's easier in some areas than it is in others. Uh, so while it may be easy if you, all you're doing is uh, counting numbers and comparing uh, our demographics with the community's demographics, uh, that's kind of cheating the system and not really being genuine with, with uh, goals because if you were going to really uh, have that kind of representation, you need it across the organization. Um, what I mean by that is you need to have folks in uh, all areas of your organization um, throughout uh, the organization from top to bottom. Middle management, senior management, it needs to be represented well uh, across the way. Uh, one example I would give, uh, we have had considerable problems in our own community, uh, my own community of uh, St. Joseph, Missouri, in trying to uh, diversify and have more uh, minorities and women in particular in our fire department. And uh, we couldn't, we could no longer passively uh, just accept resumes and do some promotion. We actually had to do some recruiting uh, specifically to do that. And uh, we've had great, relatively good success with that. Uh, so that's um, an activity that has to be provided more than lip service. It actually has to have some action steps to it, much as you just suggested, uh, in order to uh, accomplish that goal. Okay. Thank you very much. I have no more questions. Sure. Uh, Ms. Campbell. So the, um, you and I talked about this, the economic development cork is out of the bottle in Pensacola, uh, and there's no putting it back in. This is both good for our community, but it's a task on our infrastructure. And I believe you have uh, some experience with such growth uh, in St. Joseph. So if you could touch on that, number one. And then uh, number two, um, with this type of growth, it's, it's imperative that we work or you work with, uh, we, we have a parallel board with our county commission, and it's mm -hmm. imperative that we work together. And I know you touched on this on your 90-day uh, plan, but how do you uh, plan to hit the road, hit the ground uh, running with uh, those other ent government entities in our area? Okay. Um, utility service is more than just um, simple utility service. It's actually a means for the adjacent and surrounding communities to uh, grow. It's an economic development tool, quite frankly. So uh, especially since this is a public board as opposed to a private investor-owned utility as uh, several of the others, there's the added need and sense of urgency to uh, work together with um, the city, the county, and others to uh, expand and grow. In our own community, um, we have a residential population of about 78, 80,000. Uh, however, our wastewater load to our plant, uh, if you convert the, the loading, BOD, suspended solids, all those factors that you've, you've heard staff talk about, if you convert that to a residential equi equivalent, we have, we're serving about 225,000 people because we have a very heavy uh, industrial base. And that industrial base um, is vitally important, not only in terms of jobs, but also in terms of helping um, supply some under underlying uh, revenue stream for particularly the secondary portion of our plan. Uh, we, ha we have a uh, industrial park built literally around our large uh, wastewater treatment plant, and uh, they uh, all have primary treatment uh, on site, and then they pump to our secondary where we provide secondary treatment. Uh, so we have a rate structure such that it's cost of service based. If you're a residential uh, uh, owner, you pay collection system, primary and secondary treatment. If you're a wholesale customer and you have treatment on site, then you enter our plant at the secondary portion of the plant and that's the only portion you pay. So um, having industry is important. Uh, it helps the community, it widens your revenue base and uh, it's an important relationship to build with, uh, with the adjacent uh, communities. So industry could pretty much help your rate payers? Um, absolutely. In fact, um, I, I currently sit on our economic development board uh, in our community and also our um, Mitchell Business Park board. You know, we work together with uh, the community 
and we also reach out to our local utilities, both investor-owned as well as uh, certainly the city already owns the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, but it's those partnerships that help uh, retain existing businesses, which people don't talk enough about, the importance of retaining your existing businesses as well as recruiting uh, other outside businesses to your community. Thank you very much. And thank you again uh, for your 90-day action plan. I appreciated it last time, and I appreciate it this time. Yeah. Dr. Walker. Mr. Woody, um, some scientists have projected that sea level will rise three feet by the end of this century, by 2100. Uh, that's a high level. I, if so, yes. I expect that, uh, I, I, well, I wonder whether anyone would still live on Pensacola Beach or on Perdido Key. Uh, uh, an, infra, uh, an agency such as ours has to be concerned about the protection of infrastructure, uh, especially underground pipes that uh, can be affected by uh, groundwater level increases and so forth. I also read, have read that, that climate change and the consequences of it will cost the American economy, excuse me, hundreds of billions of dollars in uh, by the end of the century. It's a bit unclear statement, but uh, it apparently means something serious. So it will become increasingly hard to, to finance the uh, responses to climate change as we approach, as we get closer to the end of the century. So at what point do we begin to worry about this? Uh, uh, at what point do we even begin to consider stopping investing money and in infrastructure on Perdido Key and Pensacola Beach uh, and other low areas of the county. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this? Have you had any experience with uh, dealing with such with resiliency issues? I know you live along the, uh, the Missouri River and, and that can be a mighty, mighty river sometimes. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the, the term of arts in um, in the uh, city management and public works field is sustainability. And uh, we use that term a great deal to address a whole wide range of uh, approaches to how we deal with uh, long-term planning. Uh, regardless of what side of the argument about climate ch change you, you, you sit on, um, there are issues that we need to deal with going forward. Uh, absolutely, and uh, it needs to be a key part of long-range planning. Um, while the uh, it's debatable about the um, uh, how quickly things are, are changing, it would be irresponsible as a, a community or as a utility to to not hit it straight on. The um, some examples in my own background uh, where we have worked on those sorts of things. We have a landfill gas to energy project. We collect uh, methane from our landfill and uh, run it through a uh, generator and, right, and feed it right back into the grid. We've been doing that for quite some time and it produces a nice $90,000 a year revenue stream to our landfill as well. Uh, we use uh, methane gas from our uh, mesophilic and thermophilic uh, digesters at the plant to uh, heat our uh, heat exchangers and reduce our uh, revenue there as well. And we have uh, a whole host of projects associated with our um, um, municipal separate storm sewer uh, permit through the state that are associated with uh, environmental projects, um, both along our parkway system and uh, throughout the uh, community as well. Uh, but each one of those projects, those in the past and several more that are slated for the future, are those that we've uh, identified that we need to be doing well in advance uh, over an extended period of time. Um, being more specific to here though, that's um, a lot of technical challenges with uh, rising ocean levels. Uh, again, it would have to be a factor of um, addressing the need while you're making current investments, looking forward to the future, and uh, having a proper um, capital program that addresses some of your uh, key critical infrastructure. 
Mr. Perkins. Thank you. I saw on your resume where you had worked in Kansas for quite a while, and I was wondering how the people of the state of Kansas feel about the Chiefs, Chiefs winning the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing what you can do with uh, state lines with just a marker, <laughs> black magic marker. More serious. By, by the way, speaking, since you mentioned the Chiefs, mm -hmm. uh, the city of St. Joseph is the summer home of the Chiefs. Uh, they've had their training camp there for 10 years now. That's awesome. We are very proud to call them our own. So. Well, that's good because it segues into one thing I want to talk about, which was teamwork. And like Ms. Campbell said, we, um, you know, we are different from a lot of communities in that our, our utilities and our sanitation are separated out. And so we, um, you know, we have to work with the county on some issues, like they, they control the landfill. Mm -hmm. We have neighboring communities that we do recycling or sanitation pick up in Santa Rosa Santa County. Rosa. We, um, you know, provide infrastructure services in the city of Pensacola. And so we have to coordinate with them so we don't disrupt traffic or we, you know, we have paving issues and stuff sometimes an additional thing is we have a legislative request we're trying to work with the legislature and then our community is unique in in some ways in that nowhere in the southeastern united states do you have a previously undeveloped downtown on the waterfront and because we had a sewage treatment plant right in the middle of our downtown with an incinerator and everything for decades our waterfront didn't develop over time like most communities has. And so we are now seeing a lot of uh, development going on downtown. And it's, and it's kind, of a, kind of a blessing in disguise. It's yeah. a good thing. I mean, we Brian may see Robert. a cruise ship in here soon because of the stuff. It's, it's an exciting, vibrant downtown. My sister visited from Boston with her family. We went down to gallery night and had a blast. And she's like, wow, I didn't know Pensacola had so much going on. So it, it's, really, it's really starting to thrive. But, but while it does, it's, it's going to be pretty important for us to be able to, to uh, collaborate and, and have teamwork with a lot of other entities. Do you have any experience with the teamwork approach? To, to um, let me give you two examples, one uh, that's currently in action and one that's uh, just now finishing up. The one that's currently in action, um, <coughs> if you were to visit our community, uh, you can come into downtown versus, uh, on an uh, elevated um, double-deck bridge right along the riverfront. Unfortunately, that was built in the early 70s with the idea of getting traffic to downtown, but without much thought about how that separated downtown from our riverfront, both visually as well as uh, in every other sense of the word, quite frankly. Uh, and our community has regretted that ever since. Uh, right now, the Missouri Department of Transportation is going through a um, services study on that bridge because there's about 50 million dollars worth of maintenance work that needs to be done on it and we're doing an evaluation of alternatives to get rid of that bridge and provide alternative means of transportation into and through the downtown area and restore our connection to downtown uh, we've done a riverfront development plan to um, make the best benefit we can on that and um, uh, a few years ago, we increased our hotel motel tax an additional 3% uh, with it earmarked for nothing but riverfront development. So we have a series of projects along our riverfront that are all coming together concurrently with that um, highway project. That's going to be a long-term project. It started four years ago. It will be seven years now probably before the bridge actually goes down because it uh, has a federal designation. So that's, that's an important uh, one. Uh, a second quick uh, example, uh, being on the Missouri River, we have a federal levee system that helps protect us from floods. And um, we had a tremendous flood in 1993 that actually breached oh, one of our levees yeah. and, and wiped out uh, our airport, quite frankly, where we had a, a Missouri Air National Guard base um, to come back from that, we worked with the U.S. Army Corps, Corps of Engineers, and uh, the example I want to give about working with different folks in this particular case is we're now in phase three of a four-phase construction project to completely rebuild those levees, elevate and provide us additional protection. But the financial partnership for that project, 65% of it was federal government. But of the 35% uh, remaining, 
We have funding from the state of Missouri. We went to the General Assembly and got $3 million. Um, the city of St. Joseph, the county of Buchanan, three local levy districts, and then we also went to the voters and got a quarter cent sales tax for four years. That is every level of, from federal to the man on the street, uh, quite level of cooperation in order to fund that project. Thank you. Um, I don't know if it's like this in Missouri, but in, but in Florida, you know, we, we, have, we have beautiful beaches, we have a, a wonderful climate, and, and we're, you know, our, our people care very deeply about protection of the environment. And so, in addition to that, we have, um, we have, we have to overbuild because a lot of times we have summer seasons where, where we get throngs come from all over, and, and so we have to kind of over-engineer and overbuild for stuff. How do, you, uh, how do you see yourself, or have you had experience kind of um, dealing with having to maneuver around, you know, doing projects when you've got hordes of people coming in at busy times and managing around that, and, you know, not only environmental compliance, but um, projects you've done that are, that are really environmentally friendly or proactive. Well, I can't say that we have quite the extremes that you're just de describing seasonal in terms of the volume of people. Uh, I will say just more specific to the wastewater system, uh, our particular wastewater system in St. Joseph is a combined sewer system. Uh, stormwater and sanitary sewer flows in the very same pipe. In fact, we have our own consent order that we're dealing with on that very subject in order to reduce flows. Um, but I say that to, to uh, illustrate the um, the challenges we have at our wastewater treatment plant. It's a 54 million gallon per day facility, even though the dry weather flow is more like 15, because less than a quarter to a half inch worth of rain will uh, completely uh, occupy the maximum capacity of that wastewater treatment plant and will then start producing overflows to the, to the Missouri River, because um, our collection system in several places are 17 feet in diameter pipes even though the, the, the major inflow system to the wastewater treatment plant is only about 55 inches, uh, at least uh, coming in the front door. So um, I'm used to, to um, dealing with and designing with facilities that um, will take the low flow uh, during dry weather and still being able to address um, the uh, maximum rate, rates of flow as well. So it involves a lot of redundancy uh, alternative systems, low weather, high weather uh, flow. Um, SCADA is a wonderful thing. You, as an organization, have done a fantastic job at um, automating your system so that you have instant data and quick response, and you're to be, you and your staff are to be commended for, for having done that. That um, takes a lot of um, evaluations and long-term planning to do that well. Thank you. And lastly, you know, we we're talking about diversity, and I also want to talk about economic diversity. And in, in a lot of communities, the, the the wealthier neighborhoods get everything they need, and, and all their needs are, are taken care of. And it, as a board, we've always been pretty pretty conscious about trying to take care of everybody. You know, we do our septic tank abatement programs, and you know, District Three done a lot of a lot of work in District Three and some of the. Uh, poor neighborhoods, and we've tried to always judge, make our decisions based on people's needs, not their, not their affluence or their economic status. And sometimes we get pressure. We put a, a big storage treatment tank that, by gravity, it was at the end of the line. It's an emergency storage tank for a huge line in a very affluent area, and, and we caught all kind of grief for that, but it was it was the right thing to do. And so sometimes you know, we have to make hard, hard political decisions um, in order to take care of the people, you know, to take care of everybody. And, and I don't know if you've had experience with that that you could highlight, but, but one, one area that, that I see coming and that I think our board members have seen coming is workforce housing, affordable housing. As we prosper, as this area grows, I think we need to work with, you know, the county and the city are starting to talk about workforce housing, some of the developers are starting to talk about that. I, I think we need to be flexible or, or 
analyzing policy to see how we can work with and promote um, housing, not just for the people who can buy the, you know, the three hundred thousand dollar home, but the but the working people that you know need to be able to get into a house for eight hundred a month or buy a buy a eighty thousand dollar home. How can we how can we um, make sure that we're serving all of those people, not just you know the ones who make the big political contributions and who have the uh, the most influence in their in their uh, county. Well, in response to your question about uh, providing an equal level of service to an appropriate level of service, a uh, quick example that comes to my mind is, uh, it's outside of utilities, but um, is our approach to how we do our maintenance paving, contracted maintenance uh, program. We have a pavement, uh, and this actually is applicable to utilities too, but uh, we have a very objective means by which we rank and prioritize the, the needs for our maintenance activities. Uh, that is 100% independent of the wealth or affluence of a particular area. It's based on the objective needs of uh, the roadway, its, it's, it's structure, its uh, average daily traffic, its um, uh, how it's constructed, et cetera. Uh, the county or the uh, council members that I've worked with have always uh, appreciated that and actually used that as a means to keep politics out of those decisions by saying this this particular one is objectively based. It's based on the needs of the organization and the way that we can most efficiently um, deal with uh, the, the needs that, that have to be accomplished. In fact, in our community, I would say that most often, because of the age of the streets, more often benefits the uh, lower income, older neighborhoods, actually, than it does the, the newer uh, neighborhoods. Uh, that can and should be used, likewise, in, in your maintenance programs for uh, your utility and uh, hopefully should answer some of those needs. Now, as that ties to workforce uh, development and housing, um, I would see that the housing portion of that probably more influenced by policy decisions being made by uh, your local municipality and county. But if you have the appropriate relationships with those uh, folks and you're working on a regular basis about the utility needs associated with that growth, then you can be a partner to help accelerate or help that to be accomplished as you do your regular logical progression of your collection system or your distribution system, depending on what you're talking about. Thank you. One, one last sure. closing thing. I really appreciate you coming back and being committed to seeking this position. I've talked with you on the phone and I know that it's something that really interests you. You like the utility aspect of it. That's mm -hmm. an area of specialization. But I do want to say that I appreciate you coming back for a second interview when you weren't picked the first time when we extended an offer to somebody else. That shows real enthusiasm and character. A lot of people would have said, I'm taking my ball and going home, you know. But uh, I'm glad you're here, and I, I appreciate the interview. And I think you did well. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That's Similarly, welcome. I appreciate the, the check. -in. I have a final question. Uh, yes. We have three line functions, water, sewer, wastewater, and uh, sanitation of those three with which are you least familiar and what would you do to bring yourself up to speed uh, the, over the course of my career I have spent less time with um, potable water than I have the other two uh, to a degree uh, although I need to qualify the sanitation side um, the city of St. Joseph owns and operates a municipal solid waste landfill and recycling. Uh, we don't do the collection. I realize that's opposite sides of the field, but I'm very intimately familiar with the, the, um, the sanitation business uh, broadly. Um, but my water experience, even though it may be limited, uh, may be lesser than the other two, uh, it was very intensive uh, during the time that I was involved with that. Worked for the city of Olathe for uh, a number of years, and during that time did uh, engineering design work. Uh, worked with uh, developers on review and extension of mains. Uh, it was primarily transmission distribution rather than at the plant uh, per se. Um, my, my ability to um, become more attuned to and get up to speed on that 
aspect of, of this position is really not any different than it is going to be to learn the infrastructure of this organization coming in from the outside. Uh, I have um, a lot to get familiar with, and I'll do that through uh, being out in the organization with the people. Um, that isn't just studying uh, engineering drawings and GIS maps in the office. That's actually um, spending some time in a wrap truck with a, with a um, um, driver, uh, spending a, some time with a, a meter reader uh, part of an afternoon. Um, that also gives me an opportunity to hear more from uh, the folks out doing the job and gives an opportunity to meet and greet those and get some good feedback from the frontline folks. Uh, Mr. Woody, there was a lot to like about your application. I, you know, I, you, you started off by talking about communication, not just with the board, with the employees, with the community. Mm -hmm. You have a broad idea of what that constituency looked like, and you talk about partnerships in the community, and I think those, those reflect the priorities of this board. Um, we, as a board, I think if you asked us what's most important to us, I think we would say customer service is one of the most important things to us. And I noticed, well, I noticed that you like to measure things. You're I'm an engineer. A, you're an engineer, <laughs> right. And so you don't just have goals. You say, this is where we are, this is where we yeah, need to be. Metrics are important. And, and you uh, said, what, did you say something? I'm sorry. Uh, metrics are important. Yes, yes. Um, you increased customer service scores in categories by a fairly substantial amount. Tell me how you did that. Uh, the particular example given there is in our um, building regulations division. Uh, they had struggled for some period of time with uh, customer service uh, turnaround. Uh, we had done some uh, community, some surveys uh, based on, on uh, the customers that actually use that division. Every time they were issued a permit, we started handing out the surveys to get some f direct feedback from the actual customers of the service. And that gave us a better feel for uh, where we were strong and where, where we were weak. Uh, probably the one thing that changed uh, that customer service uh, the most uh, was in an area where we're getting the most complaints, and those were from commercial developers and commercial builders. Although we had pretty good uh, and fast turnaround times, they were frustrated that they had to deal with departments separately and independently. Uh, so instead of having a, a permittee coming in and having to go to public works, go to the fire department, go to the health department, get all these different permits, we instituted a position for commercial and industrial review. They were the interface then for the development review uh, committee that reviewed plans. And that way, the outside customer had one person to deal with. And if there were any turf wars between departments or disagreements or whatnot, that dirty laundry got hashed out and resolved and compromised. And then the forward-facing, customer-facing individual then dealt with our customer. And of course, that model would apply to various other challenges. I, yeah, you can apply that in many ways. So I have no more lights. I, I will ask you one last question. Okay. And Mr. Perkins commented that you have come back. If offered this job, would you accept? Uh, yes, I wouldn't have been here the first or the second time if I wasn't interested. Thank you. I'm so, I'm so sorry, I just wanted to make one more comment. Just, and only because there, are, there could be some of our um, constituents and, and elected officials and others that, that are out there watching this online. I, I wanted people to know about your action plan and, and the relationships that you want to build in your first 90 days. They not only include the ECUA board, our wonderful staff, but they include all the municipal and county and elected officials, uh, the state officials in this area, the Chamber of Commerce, that really speaks to me. I, ser I serve uh, on the Perdido Area Chamber of Commerce. It's our 35th year. We just won a national award. We also have a African American Chamber of Commerce. We have uh, the Pensacola Chamber of Commerce that's very active. That speaks that you wanna be here for not only us, our utility, you want to be here for the community, and, and that speaks volumes to me. So I, I just wanted the public to know how uh, engaged you want to be in our entire community, not just the ECUA. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Woody. All the lights are off, so we will excuse you. And I think we're going to take a five-minute break.
convene our meeting and the next the third candidate is mr. John Palmer uh, mr. Palmer if you will just you could just tell us what we forgot to ask you in our individual individual interviews and then we will ask you questions okay madam chairman members of the board first of all I'd like to say thank you for this opportunity to interview uh, I appreciate the opportunity it's, it's an honor to interview and um, uh, I've, some of you have known me for quite a while. I hope you got to know me a little better this morning, um, and I hope you liked what you learned. And uh, I've been here almost 20 years. I intend to be here um, a lot longer. Uh, I'm in this town, uh, not another 20, but a, a lot longer. I'm, this is my town, this is my city, and this is where I want to stay. These, I, love, I love this place. Uh, I think we do great things. And I want to continue to help this utility do great things. And uh, I would like to be your next executive director. Now, to your question, uh, what you didn't ask, you may not have asked uh, about my family. I know I talked to some of you about my family. I'm, uh, my better half, uh, my wife, uh, my wonderful wife. I have uh, been married 33 years to the same woman. Uh, we have uh, four children. I have five grandchildren, two more on the way. I'm expecting one more any, any day. So that was, uh, I've been living in the same house for 27 years. And so I'm, I'm pretty steady. Uh, that's what I kind of wanted you to get out of that message. Um, I, what else didn't you ask? Uh, I don't know. Let's, let's go ahead with the question. Sure. <laughs> I don't see a light, so I want to start with, I love that you said I like my current position and even love my current position 95% of the time. I hope that all of our employees feel that way, and I certainly would hope that as executive director, you would do things to make the employees feel that way. What would you do to make working here a better experience for, for the employees? You know, first of all, I would say it is a good experience for most employees, mm -hmm. and uh, we do a good job of, of reaching, I think, our employees. It's, we have good benefits. We have, I think, reasonable pay for what we do. Uh, I think there are some very good things, you know. If you look, though, at uh, why people leave somewhere or the satisfaction of what's going on, it's usually not related to those things. It's related to who they work for and uh, the manager or that position. And so, you know, it, it, where there are issues and, uh, you know, there, there are some divisions in this company that uh, we have high turnover and I, I don't know the reasons exactly for those and I would want to look into those to find out what those reasons are. Some of them seem self-evident, you know, customer service, who would want to listen to people complain all day, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but I, I would want to look into those to see if there's some way to improve that turnover. I know sanitation has a, a large turnover, and, and I would like to, to, to focus on those to see what we can do to uh, improve morale in those areas and, and change the turnover. Dr. Walker. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Campbell. I see your hand, and I see your light, Ms. Campbell. <laughs> So um, if you weren't my first choice, it would only be because the, the water wastewater portion of our 
utility runs smoother than anything. Thank you. And um, I, I would be afraid that without you there, um, that might suffer, but you'd still be at the helm, so you'd still be um, easily accessible. Um, I'm glad to know that you're not planning on retiring anytime soon. How would you let the rest of the county know more about our systems and why it's such a great place to live because that, uh, and touch on every soldier has what? <laughs> um, let, me, let me start by saying the water and wastewater group is doing well. Uh, I have three very good people who work for me, who report to me. I couldn't be happier with their performance and what they do. And uh, so, uh, you know, we have a good group. Um, we talked uh, a little bit about customer service and how we could improve customer service. And I relayed the story that when I was in consulting, we used to get the speech that uh, everybody working at consulting should be in marketing. Just like in the Army, every sh soldier learns how to carry a rifle. And the same story, if you can, in consulting, you need to be in marketing. In this business, you need to focus on customer service. And, and so that was the, the story about every soldier carries a rifle. Everyone should be involved in marketing. And uh, I'm sorry, everyone should be involved in customer service. If I might sure. uh, you ask about the county, I'm sorry. Um, you, you know, I wrote what I thought I would do if selected for this position. And one of the things I mentioned is uh, reaching out, setting up a meeting with the county, with DEP. I've actually even talked about setting up a meeting with DEP uh, already uh, with the new executive director. I would reach out to, uh, again, to the health department, to DEP, to the county, and meet with them to see if we can find ways to work better together. Uh, and. Uh, as you mentioned also about uh, telling others about this place, I guess uh, uh, social media I think is very important. Uh, I think it's somewhere, something we need to, to help focus on, improve on, uh, something we need to do a better job of getting our messages out, uh, get more following on our website, uh, or I mean on our uh, Facebook site, and uh, just improve uh, the message. Thank you. Um, you got a one. You got one leg up on on these other guys because you know a little bit more about our uh, organization. And so, with that, um, I wanted to ask you, uh, what do you feel is the most pressing matter in number one, the area of wastewater, water and wastewater, and how would you address it? Number two, sanitation, and how would you address it? And then number three, customer service, and how would you address that and make our uh, us more customer centric organization okay pressing needs in water and wastewater some of the uh, bigger pressing needs concerns I have going forward is with coming regulations uh, I'm very concerned about some of the proposed regulations out there regarding uh, PFAS regarding um, uh, lead and copper, there's a proposed lead and copper rule right now that would require us to monitor 20% of the schools, monitor 20% of the daycares to confirm every single water service we have, not only our service, but the customer service. Um, and, and so those are, to me, they're not passed yet, and they may not be passed in that form, but they are a concern, they're, they're a pressing matter. Um, you know, maybe I'm borrowing trouble that I don't have, but it is a concern we need to be looking at and going forward with. Uh, as far as pressing matter and sanitation, uh, you know, the last two board meetings, we've had somebody here complaining about the sanitation service. We need to do a better job responding to those complaints. Uh, I, I think we need to spend a little time, see what we're doing, seeing where customer service is working uh, with sanitation and doing a better job following up um, and, and get people answers and get responses to them. Uh, 
Uh, as far as customer service, it's, it's not really uh, my expertise, but I would like to spend some time in customer service, uh, getting, listening to some of these phone calls, getting to know a little better what they do, how they do it, and, and uh, see what we can do. I, you know, Gabe, you know Gabe, Gabe does a great job, and I have a lot of confidence in Gabe, and, but I'd like to work with him and see what we can do. Thank you, and, and any time you have legislative re concerns, we're, we're your people too, so okay. you, let us, you let us know if we can carry anything forward for you. Thank you so much. I enjoyed uh, getting to know you a little better in your concerns today. And if I might follow up on Ms. Campbell, I think we ought to get a resume from our leadership team routinely. It was so much fun to read all of the things that you have done that we didn't know about. It's, um, we need to celebrate. I mean, Thank you. you have done so many innovative things besides putting your finger in the dike on many <laughs> occasions as well. Uh, Dr. Alexander. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Palmer, for having an opportunity to meet with you this morning. It was quite a delightful uh, uh, opportunity for us to sit down and chat a little bit. I have a series of questions here I have here for you. And I'll tell you why these questions are important for me and I think would be to this board and also the citizens who are listening across this region. Uh, you've been here for a number of years and, uh, and you've been in a senior management type of position. So <clears throat> looking at it from that perspective, as a senior manager, uh, if you were to go into this position as executive director and having had a work history with a number of people inside this organization that you've come to know over the years, and one day they're your peers and the next day you're their boss, and what is in important for me to be able to understand, and I think it's important for this board to be able to understand, how do you make that transition from peer friend to that of now uh, being the executive in charge and being responsible uh, for uh, their work and being able to manage them and you feel that's something you're capable or are you going to have a challenge to do? Because too many times over the years, uh, in my experience as an executive, I've seen and promoted people from one position to another position, but it's had been very difficult for them to make the transition from friend to boss. And I need to get a sense from you, and this is just my first question, but I need to get a sense from you uh, have you given thought to that and how would you see yourself making that transition? Okay. First of all, I'd like to say we do have a good group of senior management here. They are self-starters, a lot of them. They are very initiative and, you know, you can set goals, you can set guidelines, you, and they will, most of them will run with that ball. Uh, I think all of them will run and, and do and you have to follow up on that as far as it's just a matter of management I do think people are our biggest acts asset and when we work together we work better and uh, you know I I don't I, I do have to be able to say no uh, and, and do it quite often as the senior leader uh, these people like to spend money uh, I get that. We want to solve problems. We want to do good things, but uh, I have to be the one who says no. And uh, that's just part of the job is the way I see it. Uh, I've hired people. I've fired people. I've worked with peers and uh, done it in the past. And it's, uh, it's working with people more so than being the boss, but still the buck stops with me. I've got to be the one to be able to say no. And I, I don't see that as a real issue here uh, going forward, And but it, if, it, if it is, I will work on it. My next question relates to the culture of ECUA, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm going to assume you are uh, quite familiar with, being that you've been here for some time. 
if you could tell us of a situation where you changed the organizational culture here to make it more responsive and citizen centric if you've had that experience and if you have can you know can you share certainly i can those, respond really? to the culture not so much citizen but it does relate when i first came to main street the year before i was there we had over 500 violations there was an attitude of no big deal we're doing what we've always done we'll, we'll, we'll work for it uh, nobody really wanted to solve the problem, it seemed like. Nobody really cared that much about it. And we were able, I, I spent a lot of time with the operators convincing them to do things differently, explaining to them why we need to do things differently. Um, uh, you know, Pat Byrne, my supervisor at the time, told me one time he got so tired of me talking to this one individual about the sludge blankets that he had to go up and shut the door because uh, he was tired of hearing the reasons why. But we were able to change that culture uh, where at one point they just didn't get the samples they needed from Santa Rosa Sound. Why didn't they pull the samples? Uh, because the boat was broken. And why didn't they fix the boat? Well, that's somebody else's job. Why didn't you charter a boat, you know? And, and so we, we made it clear that's not an acceptable excuse. And, uh, I, and, and working with the operators, working with the people, letting them know it was important, let them know we cared, I think made a tremendous difference. And uh, I can't say that really related to the citizens, but more so the operators. Uh, letting them know we care and we're going to do this right. We're going to get rid of these violations. We're going to run this place the best we can. So, so uh, I'm going to need to follow up to that because it, it sounds like what you're explaining uh, is that there, certainly there was something inside the culture that was not right. Correct. But from what I hear you describing, it sounds more of a symptom what you're articulating in terms of things they had been doing. It appears to have been a symptom to a bigger problem inside the organization, right? And if that is the case, then how are you certain that you address the culture of where that stems from, those behaviors stem from? Because it's there where if, if we can identify what was creating that last of days of goal, this is how we used to do it, attitude that permeated that particular situation or that environment. That sounds like to me there are symptoms of a bigger problem. And if that is the case, for someone in the role of an executive director is not just being able to identify the symptoms, but how do I approach it wholly because I may have a much greater problem here than, than, than just a demonstration of bad attitude or, or this is just how we do it. Uh, because, <clears throat> I, you know, I just think that anyone uh, who comes into this role as an executive director, most organizations, in particular of this size, uh, will probably need a thorough assessment in, in how do we assess that organization in a way that not just identify the symptoms of things that are wrong, but how do we really go after some type of uh, cultural change, if you will, understanding that most organizations don't want to be changed. Right. And if you tell them they're going to, we got to change the culture, then we usually get resistance. And sometimes that resistance is pretty blatant, and sometimes that resistance is, is experienced in a very passive aggressive kind of way. Uh, so uh, just as, you know, it's just something to think about. You don't really have to give me an answer, but just something to think about uh, because it, 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 it certainly can be a pretty complex issue. I, I, I have one more question, uh, Madam Chair, uh, and it's one in which I want to make sure and one you and I had an opportunity to talk about this morning, uh, and that is around uh, customer service. 
I just heard you mention yesterday, a, a few moments ago, to one of my colleagues uh, around the issue of customer service is that you would work on it. I need to, I need you to talk a little bit more about that, because going into this role as a executive director, uh, I, I, you know, I think we all need to feel a little more because that's something all of us here, I'm quite certain, hold very dearly as customer service. So I need some, we need some, uh, I need some more information or experience, if you would tell me how you plan to, to, to uh, enhance customer service within, within ECUA based on your experience here in the past for a number of years. And if you were to go into this position, uh, how would you think about it? Now, that's one part of the question. The second part of the question you and I talked about, and myself and this board certainly hold of great value, is also diversity inside the organization. From those at entry level, right up through middle management, right up to senior leadership, <coughs> is being able for this ECUA and its leadership to be able to uh, look like the community in which it serves. And we know we wanna see, I think we all wanna see the most qualified, the best qualified individuals they are. And, but I think we have to be sensitive to the fact when we're hiring at entry level, whether we're hiring engineers, whether we're hiring middle managers or executives to yourself or assistants to yourself, how do you think about the diversity? How do you, uh, how do you em embrace it? And give me a couple examples of what you've done over two years. And this is one question I'm really interested in knowing, hearing an answer to. If you will, give me an example, a couple examples of how you have demonstrated or uh, helped move the whole diversity issue within ECUA from a senior executive in which you held for some time? Okay, that's a lot of questions. Uh, I would like to say a couple things real quick about the cultural change because it does relate to customer service possibly. Mm -hmm. um, in 2005, there were some management, or 2000, before I went to Main Street, I'm sorry, it was 2004 I went to Main Street. Before that, there was different management and they, I don't think, respected the, the people that worked there. Uh, I heard some, some pretty bad stories, and I think that was part of the culture, and that was part of the change, and that's something we would have to work on uh, to, to improve. Uh, I think we've done that in water reclamation um, as far as respecting people. Uh, you know, when I say, something about customer service, you have to understand I, I, my customer service is occasionally I get a call from a customer about a development or something, but not our regular customers. It's somebody trying to do something. And I don't have a lot of experience with the phones and what we do and customer service. And that's why I give you kind of a bland answer of I would have to work on it. First thing you would have to do is I have to get familiar Number one, with exactly what they do there, uh, what kind of calls, and what are the problems, and how how are the people? Uh, I, you know, I have to learn about what they do, learn what goes on there, mm -hmm. and that's the first step. And mm -hmm. and identifying the symptoms uh, is part of the is part of it. If once you find the symptoms, then you work towards the mm -hmm. root cause. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what those root causes are at this point, and that's something I would have to work on. Um, you ask about diversity. Uh, I think we can improve on what we do here. Uh, I think, especially in senior management and engineering, you know, we generally advertise on our website, and that's not a very big audience. Uh, I think we can start looking uh, the whole picture, review what we do from the posting, what does it say, is it just the standard equal opportunity 
employer to mm -hmm. include some potentially a little more friendly uh, diverse language uh, to look at where that posting is and <clears throat> reach out uh, to different places potentially. We have hired three engineers uh, from college job fairs, two uh, from Auburn, one from South Alabama, and we could do uh, a job fair because we, we have a hard time hiring engineers, and so it's a good way to get them is to go to the colleges and find them. And we, we are director of regional services is uh, one person who we've got that <coughs> way. And I, I, you know, we should reach out to somewhere like FAMU that's fairly close, that it has a diverse uh, background, and that's something we can do. And we can also look for uh, people who may uh, refer people to us. We can reach out to lots of other places that would have a broader diversity mm -hmm. uh, as far as hiring. Uh, you ask about the culture here. Uh, we are a pretty diverse organization at the lower end. It's just the upper end. And we like to hire uh, from within uh, where we can and, and promote people that deserve it. We don't always. But, uh, and, and so we have to start working that process a little better and just being more friendly, more open, and that may take uh, some, something similar to the training that uh, Vicki has referenced for customer service. It's just, uh, okay. I, I, you know, and just for the, uh, you know, for the sake of the board, uh, myself and Mr. Palmer had this conversation this morning, so nothing that I'm asking him here is totally new to him uh, because I think it was important uh, as you heard me ask all the candidates around customer service which is hugely important and around the importance of embracing diversity is something uh, that we have to make sure that we think about uh, in this environment or any other environment Pensacola is not the old sleepy town it used to be is emerging, evolving 21st century small city, if you will, uh, that is finding its way uh, on the map, other than just being defined by a beach, but also is being defined by its culture, is being defined by its industry, and we're seeing that evolution take place right in front of us. Uh, so I appreciate your, your honest and candid responses in regards to understanding the importance of it because for myself and everybody that's on this board, whoever gets this job, uh, that is not going to go away. So yes, sir. thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Walker. Mr. Palmer, uh, sea level is going to rise 30, uh, three feet in by the year 2100. Uh, you got that? I got yeah, that. You got that. Uh, hope not, but I, we, I are, <laughs> we are on the seacoast. Uh, uh, a three-foot rise here would, might wipe out uh, Pensacola Beach and Perdido Key and some other areas, too. Uh, ECUA has a – ECUA should be a proactive, and I think, in and, uh, and getting ready for these changes. Uh, what have we done in the past? Uh, and what might we do in the, say, the next 15 or 20 years? Uh, if you were executive director, you might be in that office for that, that long. Uh, what, what do you think we might do to promote resiliency in response to climate change? Resiliency, I see, is, a, is number one, I think is going to be forced on us more and more. It used to be you live in the state of Florida, you have a hurricane, you shouldn't expect essential services for three days. There's legislators now who say you live in the state of Florida, you should design your system to work during a hurricane. There's a problem with that at the beach. Our systems don't work underwater. The beach, uh, parts of the beach can go underwater uh, with a storm going to Texas almost. We had uh, Hurricane Ike, beautiful sunny day going to Texas, but the storm surge at the Pensacola Beach plant was coming up in the storm drain in the parking lot in front of the plant. 
had it gone up another foot, it would have been in the plant um, main uh, screening area. And so, you know, anything we have done in the last 15, 20 years, we've tried to harden that plant. We've uh, raised the electrical controls on plant two uh, all up on top of the basin. All the pumps that surround plant two are submersible pumps. And, you know, we tried to make it as resilient as possible. Uh, when they did the upgrade in 2003 4, I wasn't involved with that upgrade, but they raised electrical panels up significantly from where they were. And so, uh, you know, there's only so much I, that I think we can do at the beach to harden it without raising the beach. And uh, gravity systems don't work well when they're flooded. Uh, you can't go from higher to lower. And so, either they have to come to some realization we're not going to use the beach in a hurricane or, you know, shortly after. But uh, I, I do know sea levels are changing. They are rising. Uh, it's something that a lot of cities are, and counties are getting very proactive about. Um, we are taking steps as we do them to be more resilient uh, across the board. Does that answer your question? In part, uh, did, did we not do a resiliency study of our water system recently? We, we haven't finished it yet, but we're in the, the closing, uh, the last part of it. We're doing a resiliency study of our water, looking at potential risk and how to mitigate those risks. And we should have a report on that. It's required to be submitted by the end of March. Uh, I'm sorry, it's required by the end of March to submit to EPA and say we've done it, uh, but we are supposed to keep that report under wraps. We're not supposed to share it with anybody to say here's where our concerns are. And, but what are we looking at in that study? Is it uh, sea wa uh, salt water intrusion or what? It's a all, all hazards approach to looking at it. And so they look at natural disasters such as a hurricane, uh, look at uh, bad actors is what they kept calling malevolent attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the things we looked at uh, was IT. You know, and you look at the probability, you look at the uh, ch chances uh, of it happening, and, and with IT, the chances of it happening is one. Somebody is attacking us every day. It has a very high probability that we're gonna get that attack. But what's the probability of it being successful? That's a different question, but uh, that was the only thing that was a one. That was the good news. <laughs> uh, when you look at malevolent attacks or something along those lines, uh, very few water systems uh, have, have had that kind of issue. And you look at the consequences of that failure, what happens, and you put a dollar, dollar value uh, on that. And so I'd be happy to sit down and go over that with you uh, once we get it done. But uh, that's what we've been looking at is trying to make the water system uh, more resilient. And uh, part of that is, again, in six months after we submit to EPA that we've done this, we're supposed to come up with a plan to address it. Madam Chairman, uh, I'll go ahead and ask a second question, sure. if I may. Okay. Uh, of the three basic functions that we, d we perform, uh, water, wastewater, and, and sanitation, uh, with which are you least acquainted and what will you do to educate yourself about it? The three basic functions, water and wastewater, I am very familiar with and what we do there. Sanitation, I've been involved in the composting. I've been to the MRF, uh, but that <laughs> is the extent of my knowledge at the MRF. Uh, I know we have a lot of truck drivers who drive around all over the place, you know, mm -mm. Uh, but I really can't tell you too much more about sanitation, and that's, uh, you know, I listed a couple places where I would need to spend time if I was elected or selected for this job, and, and one of those is sanitation. Uh, another one of those is finance, where I really need to dig into how our finances work, what are our reserves, what are our contingencies, what types of debt do we have. Those are things I want to learn more about. Uh, 
um, and uh, sanitation is a similar, it's not a black hole, but it's pretty close. Uh, I think there's a lot I could learn there, and uh, uh, it's something we'll just, uh, uh, that's where I'm going to have to spend some time. Uh, Mr. Palmer, I, you know, I think we have a water and wastewater system to be proud of, and to a large extent, that is through your leadership. I don't think any of us ever worry about not being really ahead of the curve on innovations and being prepared and that sort of thing. Um, you are also part of the bigger organization, and so you have an advantage over the others because you know this organization. Where do you see our greatest vulnerability, our greatest need for change, whether culturally, operationally, financially? Where should we be putting more money, more emphasis, more manpower? You know, my biggest concern going forward is keeping rates affordable. We're, we're going to be facing, uh, we're facing aging infrastructure failure, and some of it's not that old. We just spent $3 million replacing a pipe that was 10 years old. Um, we may have more of that to come. We have uh, some HDPE pipe that is subject to uh, oxidative stress failure, early failure of the pipe. It's happened in uh, Mobile, it's happened in Okaloosa, it's happened in Santa Rosa County. It hasn't happened to us, but we have more than eight miles of HDPE pipe in our water system. That's a concern going forward. I mentioned the lead and copper rule earlier. Uh, there's proposed uh, legislation uh, on PFAS uh, coming for biosolids, coming for effluent. We could end up with GAC filters on all our treatment plants. Who knows what a surface water uh, standard might be. We have, again, pressing needs for resiliency. Uh, I think we're going to be forced into being more resilient. Uh, more, I hate to say it, generators, we, more uh, hardening of structures, um, uh, more keeping the facility running. Um, I'm forgetting a couple things. Uh, but regardless, that's where I see our biggest concern is facing all these uh, <coughs> proposed regulations. We have a governor right now who uh, thinks that uh, utility, the municipalities, or municipalities out there, he said, that would rather pay the fine than fix the problem, and he washed his hands. And that's kind of an attitude that's in Tallahassee right now, uh, that we'd rather sweep it under the rug than fix it. The problem with that is the fines don't help. The fines come from our ratepayers. They don't solve the problem. Uh, the the fix to the problem is lots of money, and we don't have lots of money. Uh, we looked at the uh, original I and I study; they were talking about four hundred million dollars. You know, uh, that's a problem. So that's where I see our biggest challenge uh, going forward. And again, I'm looking at it from water and wastewater <coughs> mainly, and, and I don't really see that much of the other parts of the organization at this time. But. Okay, Mr. Perkins. I enjoyed, I really enjoyed meeting with you yesterday. I, you're more colorful than I thought, and I, <laughs> I, you know, for an engineer, anyways. Right. But, um, Thank you. but, <laughs> Stacy's like bowing his head over there. But, um, you know, I doubt that I will ever meet a, you know, many more substantive, honest, decent, hardworking people than you, especially in my social circles, you know, but, but, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, so you, so as far as that goes, as far as integrity and everything, I think, I think you score just off the chart, just in incredibly, right. incredibly high. What worries me, and I, I, I need you to convince me of this, is that these other candidates we're looking at have, have quite a bit of executive experience. I mean, they've, they've, um, dealt with, you know, internal and external communication, other political entities, legislatures, um, executive experience, a lot of hiring and firing, decision making, high finance, bond, bond floating, um, customer service, and, and just, a, just a, a wide breadth of experience. You are really good at what you do, but we don't know, how, I don't know how good you're going to be in these other areas. Convince me 
that you have a leadership style or some sort of life experience or work experience or something that will uh, allow me to, to, to justify choosing you over, over uh, these other candidates that we looked at. Okay. That's a big, big ticket item. Um, I have been involved with the Florida Environment Association Utility Council for eight years. I've been their treasurer for six years. Um, that is a council that uh, works on legislative issues, works on rulemaking processes. Uh, I went to Jacksonville to provide comments on NNC, uh, a five minute speech on how bad it was for us in the economy. I was on a conference call this morning at seven o'clock talking about a provision that prohibits all surface water discharges by 2025 and how uh, much money that's gonna cost and how we can work to prevent that. And you may hear from me about talking to some of our legislators about that. Uh, that that's a concern of mine. So I have been involved with the legislative process. I've been involved with uh, DEP extensively. Uh, when I first got to, to Main Street, we had multiple consent orders. We had a court order and I went through and uh, organized uh, those. We, we solved every issue but one. Uh, if you care to guess, it's odor. Uh, we never solved the odor problem uh, until we moved. But um, it, we had a plan, we were thinking about it, but we felt like we would never uh, get it done before we moved and it was gonna cost substantial money. And wasn't sure it was gonna really solve the whole problem, so it wasn't uh, the best plan to start start with. I know it would have improved it, but I don't know if it would have solved it. There were so many odors at Main Street, but I'm going uh, down a different path. Um, as far as my leadership, I think I've shown I can. I switched from engineering to operation, provided the leadership there. That was a total uh, change for me. And uh, you know, it was wastewater, but it was more working with people than working with spreadsheets. When I was in consulting, we were spreadsheets RS. But when I got uh, to operations, it's people RS. And uh, uh, so I, I can make the change. I am, uh, I'm, I'm not really young, but I'm still, uh, still can be taught new tricks, shall we say. <laughs> And I think I can provide the leadership necessary on these other issues. I, I don't know a better way to explain it. Ms. Campbell. Are you done? Oh. Um, I, again, I appreciate the fact that you, um, you put your, your name in this. Um, Thank you. Um, I appreciate your leadership on, on water and wastewater. And I hope that this has been just as good a learning experience for you as it has for all of us. Uh, I appreciate all of the staff that is out here today um, because I think I think it gave everyone a little insight of what the board wants and, and where we're headed. Um, one of the things I talked about with all of the candidates today was learning each other each other's issues, you know, um, learning water and wastewater, what their issues are. And, how it relates to your department and learning sanitation and how it relates to another department. And we did a thing called customer first at a company that I worked with. And I think I described it to you and I described it to the others. And I would have to sit in a room every year with a CEO, a janitor and a, and a clerk and a production person. And it gave me such a sense of belonging to this organization, number one, but also such a sense of what their problems were. So it was almost like an Arbinger type thing, but it was called customer first. Um, I think it would behoove us um, to do something like that. And uh, I'd like to know your thoughts on that. Would it behoove this organization for all of our employees to know more about what everyone in the entire utility does, including the board and administration? Mm -hmm. I, I think you get back to every soldier carries a rifle. Gabe has had some customer service training in here and he was gracious enough to invite other people, anybody that wanted to come. And I must say I was very disappointed 
and the attendance at uh, what he put on and that we really did not have many people outside customer service show up. And uh, yes, we need to be, we have people out in the field every day dealing with the public, even if they're just walking by. And we don't teach much in the way of customer service skills other than the customer service department. Uh, and I think that's something we, we can do, we can improve on and uh, across the board. I think it's something that we can do. My last question is, you're the only internal candidate and we have a long history in our culture that goes um, many, many years. Steve Sorrell was here for what, 16, 17, 17 16, years. Like How will a Don Palmer ECUA be different from a Steve Sorrell ECUA? Steve uh, did a lot of things great, was a great leader. He was a, uh, you know, he communicated uh, very much information to the board. I can tell you I will be a, a, a little more succinct. Uh, I think there was a lot of information that you probably didn't really care about, but maybe that's something I want to find out. Uh, Steve did four tens. Uh, I will be here five days a week. I will uh, stay here five days a week. I know Steve had, uh, I'm not exactly sure how he had his reviews, I, uh, but I understand there's some angst about it. And uh, I think that's something that we should have on a regular basis or reviews for myself and my performance and, and setting goals, setting objectives. And, and solving those issues. So, um, what else? Uh, I, I think I will be, Steve also did a very good job of painting, uh, I will say, good pictures, uh, selling the best part of everything. And I will be a little more frank with you of how we're operating and things that are going on. So, I think that pretty well sums it up. And there are no more lights on. Is there anything you want to leave us with? Because you get the last word of all the candidates. So <laughs> take advantage. You know, I, I think my job history, my work history has prepared me for this job. I've, I've made changes wherever I've been. I've improved things. I think um, I, I've worked a diverse history working with developers, working groundwater. Uh, working for utilities, working as an engineer, working in operations. I have the experience, I have the ability. I'm here, I feel like this is my utility. That was one of the things that bugged me last time going through this process that uh, I, I didn't apply because I felt like this is my utility, I should be applying. This is, these are my people and we do, we have done some great things here. Everybody said you'll never move that treatment plant, and we moved that treatment plant. Uh, building the MRF in a county uh, that uh, really didn't want a MRF, uh, shall we say, uh, I think sued us to prevent it at one time. Uh, so that I didn't have anything to do with, but it's a great achievement. And I want to be here to help lead this, this company into more great things. I'd like to be your next executive director and I appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. And I sure appreciate your enthusiasm and love for this organization. I think we share it too. Thank you. Okay, so we now we'll go into deliberations. Do you need a break or can we go right into it? Let's go. Yeah, I, I think so too. Um, Mr. Perkins. You know, all three of these candidates are highly qualified and would be a great, great executive director for any organization. And I, I, I think that, um, you know, I've, I've listened to them and, and uh, reached a decision in my mind on, on who would be best and prepared to make a nomination. You know, we can have other nominations or, or whatever, voted up or down. I think, in my opinion, that the best one that we've interviewed that would do the best job for our ratepayers that has the breadth of knowledge and experience would be Mr. Woody. I think he'd be our best choice. Um, these other candidates are wonderful. Would be would be great. Would be great candidates. And if it, Mr. Woody doesn't get it, and any and any one of these get it, I'm perfectly happy with the other two because they're all highly highly qualified, decent, um, 
good people that, that would do a good job. But, you know, the, the greatest predictor of future behavior is past behavior. And, and his, you know, experience and, um, and, and steady handedness, even in difficult situations with a, with a person who ran for mayor wanting to get rid of him, you know, and, and handling that um, to me says that, uh, that he'd do a good job for us. And so I'm prepared to, uh, to nominate Mr. Woody as our new executive director. Is there a second? Dr. Walker? Uh, Madam Chairman, I thought we would uh, do it in a different manner by I'm open to suggestions. using a ballot and, and putting our preferences on a ballot and having them added up or whatever. Uh, uh, we, we can make this up as we go along. Um, and if you, if you want to go a different way or if no one wishes to second Mr. Perkins, um, or if you... I, I would say yes, I think we should do it a different, different way. Okay with all due respect to Mr. Perkins. In that case, what if we each verbalize anything that we want to share? This is our opportunity to, to discuss among ourselves. I, I would I would draw the motion. I was just putting a motion out there so that we had a motion and we were operating sure. with a motion. But I'll, I'll, I'll draw. That's fine. Um, Ms. Campbell. Well, I'd like to say I, I was, I was came in here already, you know, to talk to Mr. Woody and offer Mr. Woody a job. And I was very pleasantly surprised with, with Mr. Warden. I, um, I really was. Um, I, I think Mr. Palmer has done a fantastic job at working with this organization. I don't think he's quite there on, on that level yet. But I admire him for coming and doing this. And I hope that he got as much out of doing it to take back to the organization as he did as we did from learning more about him, and I, I think I expressed that to him. I, I would, at this point, um, I would a actually second Mr. Perkins. Um, Let's just hold off on okay. doing it that way. But, you but I, he would be Mr. Woody would be my first choice, but Mr. Warden is not far behind. I mean, they're they're both excellent. Dr. Alexander, I'll let Dr. Walker go. I'm still. Uh, he's his flight isn't on, so um, I. I will say that I too support Mr. Woody. He has the breadth of, and, and I wish I wish you could have talked to the people I talked to. I, I asked that I asked one of them. Well, what about diversity? You know, has he created a more diverse uh, atmosphere? And they said he lives it. Uh, he had his family, and then he and his wife decided to adopt two disadvantaged children from China who had physical disabilities and have raised them. It's, it's a man who walks the walk, you know, and I think he will be sensitive to the need for the kind of diversity that I think we want to see in this organization. Um, <coughs> these people were so, um, so complimentary on specific things about his leadership that I felt that he was a good fit. I too liked Mr. Warden. I think he's extremely competent. He would be an excellent choice. Um, I asked him point blank, I know there's another job out there. And I said, tell me what happens if you're offered that other job. And he said that he would take it. And I don't think we want to go down this road again. I, I think we want to make a decision. We have three good candidates. And if one of them or two of them are committed, I think I think that's the direction that we ought to go. As for Mr. Palmer, I mean, he, he does this fabulous job for him, for us. We would have to replace him <laughs> where he is so great, and I just, I hate to have to do that. So I would concur. Uh, my first choice is Mr. Woody, and um, you know, I'm happy to do it with a motion and a second and a vote unless we want to do paper ballots. But I'd like to hear from the rest of you before we vote. Uh, now, Dr. Alexander. You don't have anything, Dr. Walker? He will. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, well, I, I, I know that I that. can I can count up to three. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I but I am I I am not saying I can't be persuaded. I mean, right. if there's a strong argument for somebody else, sure. I'm still open. Yeah. I'm yeah, not we'd dead like set. From each other. Yeah. yeah. Go, go ahead, Dr. Walker. I, well, I. Uh, 
I don't have a strong preference among the three. I like all three of them. Uh, I don't know why I didn't like Mr. Woody nearly as much the first time as I did this time. I don't know if he is if he's not he did better or 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 I listened better or what, but uh, I was very impressed by him. Uh, uh, all three, I think, were great. Uh, I want to point out that Mr. Palmer also and his wife also have adopted two right. children. I mean, I just yes. get the even yeah. the record on that. Right. Uh, but I, I really have. I can count to three, and uh, and, and I'm not unhappy with uh, with that preference. So I'll listen to Dr. Alexander now. So, so in, you know, in this process for me, uh, particularly uh, not knowing Mr. Palmer, other than the short time I spent with him today, and certainly not knowing another two candidates and being the freshman on this board, if you will, uh, my perception of the three of them uh, it's, it's, uh, and, and I don't know whether it's a strength or a weakness for me, but I happen to be a psychologist. So I'm always looking for themes and you saw very, three very distinct personalities that came before us. Uh, and I think they all are wonderful candidates. I think all of them are, are ethical and sound in terms of the history and their work performance has been articulated by, by them here tonight. Uh, and so if I make some attempt to use some deductive reasoning as to my own mental processes, how do I get to the best candidate? And for me, the way I do that is maybe kind of uh, verbally articulate my thought a little bit about each one. And starting with Mr. Palmer, uh, for someone who has been in this organization as long as he has, uh, he is and one thing I, you know, in my interview with him this morning, he said to me, and I appreciate it wholly, he said, if I don't get this job, I will be there to support whoever gets it. And I think when he said that, he said it with a great deal of sincerity and someone who, to me, that's a real demonstration of integrity, of integrity. And we know he wants the job, and uh, that was amplified here, of course. Uh, but I agree uh, 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 with uh, with you all that uh, he does not have the breadth, depth of experience for someone who's going to come in and take over this organization that is that is moving along very rapidly. And uh, but I think he is someone that this board needs to help develop. Mm -hmm. So if other opportunities, we don't know whoever gets the job, whether they'll work out or not, or whether he may go somewhere else at some point, but I think we need to put him on some type of trajectory, whoever he ends up being the next executive director, get him on a traje trajectory to get ready to be our CEO somewhere, if not here, and I think we owe him that but his lack of experience, his inability to be able to speak about customer service is, is, a, is of concern. His ability not to be able to speak about diversity is of some concern. But that does not make him a bad candidate. It means that maybe inside the system and organization itself, we're not getting people like him at senior level prepared for the next, for the next step, and I think Whoever takes this job as executive director, part of their evaluation has to be preparing the next succession of leadership. And I think Mr. Palmer need to be in that succession somewhere. Uh, Mr. Warden, I thought was an extraordinary candidate. Uh, depth of experience, great training. I certainly do admire his military history in terms of being in in engineering or in the technical science field, if you will. Uh, but I had already understood that he very well may take another position uh, if asked to do so. And that doesn't make him a bad candidate. It just means he has options, and who don't want options, right? 
And if someone else offers him a job and he's very honest with uh, Madam President, uh, 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 Madam Chair. Love that. <laughs> yeah, uh, that he'll probably go somewhere else. Then I certainly we need to we need to take that under real consideration and uh, uh, and allow him to do so. Uh, Mr. Woody, for me, uh, very distinguished, long history, great track record uh, in terms of of my thinking of his ability to be able to do this job. Uh, kind of a quiet, laid-back individual. I would encourage him, if he were offered this position, that he really needs to be a little bit more outgoing, uh, particularly in this environment where I think people that are in this room, that are employed here, need to feel him come out more, reach out to them, uh, as opposed to them reaching out to him. And I think that's a discussion that I or us certainly can have with him around that. I support uh, Mr. Woody in this position. Uh, and if that's the nomination that is made, I would second it, I would support it, I would vote for it in this process. But I want to say in closing though, I think it is important that Madam Chair, we be able to say uh, to the internal candidate, we're gonna make sure that we put things in place for him and for others to be able to be on some type of track that would help develop them so that when we ask them about diversity, when we ask them about a customer service, they're able to respond in some type of way that shows some demonstration of some things they've done. We can ask all of them, all of them the technical questions and well, none of us up here really know what they're talking about. <laughs> unless that's been your experience. But they're all engineers, they're all the scientists, they know what they're doing, we entrusted them to do that. They're the experts, we have a working knowledge of what they do. But at the end of whatever this is, and whoever takes this position, the most invaluable commodity that we have for any leader is the 600 and some people that will be working for him. And that is hugely important for me. I want him to have the technical knowledge but I also want them to be very humanistic and very sensitive to the needs and the things that are really relevant to moving any organization ahead in the 21st century. And there I will close, Madam Chair. Well, you make a wonderful point. I think it's not just Don Palmer, but it's everybody out here who needs to be growing professionally. Absolutely. And we need a culture of that. Uh, everyone needs to have new challenges, so I, I thank you for making that point. Ms. Campbell. I, I just wanted to say how much I agree with that. Um, I think Mr. Palmer, I, I'd like to see him. You know, if we, if we ever do this again, he would be the one that's chosen. Um, I know he wanted the job um, as much as anyone, and I think that he knows as much or more about water and wastewater as anyone, but, uh, you know, maybe it's time for all of our department heads to switch seats for a day, you know, just to know what's going on in Gabe's world. <laughs> Gabe's like, I can't go, wait to go to the water treatment He's facility. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, Gabe has a lot of lot of issues in his department, and they're not easy issues to to um, to get over. So I'm I'm very I want to say to my board, thank you, thank you so much for. I think every one of us spoke some of the same words up here today. The things that are important to us are the employees, the customer service, the people we serve, getting along better with other entities, government entities, le uh, legislative entities. I, I would like for the staff to know if you have legislative concerns like, like Mr. Palmer does, make sure that they get to this board because that's part of our job is to, is to carry you know a, a torch for you. Um, but. I'm going to go back to saying if, if, if it's the choice of Mr. Woody, that, that's my number one. Uh, let me ask you this. It, are they all still here? Who, how do we notify them? I'm sorry, Dr. Walker. As soon as you vote, I will text them and then call, follow okay. up with calls. I know Mr. Woody has a plane to catch at 730. So. Yeah. Um, Dr. Walker. 
Madam Chairman, after hearing the opinions expressed, I will withdraw my objection to a motion. Okay. By, so, such as the one by Mr. Perkins. Would you like to remake your motion, Mr. Perkins? Sure. I, I, a motion that we um, designate our team to uh, to offer Mr. Woody the job and negotiate a contract and bring it back to us. I it's, second. It's been moved and seconded. Ms. Campbell? Nope. I'm just Okay. Mr. Beasley? I'm sorry. I have comments following the vote. Okay. Uh, Dr. Walker? Is there, should we designate a second choice? I don't think so. What if Mr. Woody turns us down? We start over. <laughs> <laughs> Please. I, I, no, we can discuss that. I, I, that's my feeling. I, I, I see two of us saying that. And, and, and one of the reasons that I, well, you know, initially he was, he, I didn't vote for Mr. Woody. You know, and it was because kind of what Dr. Alexander said, his outgoing personality uh -huh. was, was not vibrant or vivacious enough for me to think that he'd be able to deal with the difficult environment that we have at times. You know, he, he did much better on his board interview last time than he did in my personal interview, and then this time he, he did well. And then I looked at him a lot harder this time. You know, I looked a lot harder and, and saw his experience. So I, I think we'll... Um, I think we'll do fine, but the, the reason also that I liked him was that he really wants this job. Yes. He's expressed that to me. He loves utilities, loves utility service, stuck in, stuck in this process and pursued this job actively, you know, not passively. And so I think he, I think he wants it, so I don't think we, we need another one. I agree. But, uh, but that's what I'm Yeah. And, we, and I don't want to hold the coordinator to get there. Right, exactly. I, I, I concur. Um, there are no more lights on, so we are voting on Mr. Woody as the to offer him a job and negotiate a contract for Mr. Woody to be our new executive director. Please vote. <coughs> and it passes unanimously. Mr. Beasley, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm making the assumption that I'll be charged, at least in some ways, respect with the contract um, negotiations and drafting. And I just look for a little guidance on my point of contact and input with respect to the desires of the board as to certain aspects of that contract. Obviously, it was a little bit easier with Mr. Johnson and his contract because it was interim in duration, mm -hmm. and some of the available options and benefits to the that ECA had offered Mr. Johnson actually didn't qualify for because he had already retired from the system and so forth. Um, so I guess my basic question is the logistics of of how you would like me to interact with the board as a whole in the exchange of negotiations. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. I am fine with however you see fit to contact the board and, and either email or uh, phone. But I, I understand where you're going. You know, I'm, I work in the private sector, and quite often, especially right now, uh, you offer someone something, they go back, they talk to their employer, they, you know, offer them something to stay. I don't want to lose this one because I think that's what happened with the last time. Maybe we didn't do any negotiating. I, I want the I want you to negotiate on our behalf as a board with with us. Um, talking with us during the process. And may I ask, uh, is Mr. Benziger available as part of that? Would he be a good resource for you in terms of what expectations uh, there might be in this contract? Yeah, absolutely. Um, he would be a resource would be my answer, whether he's available or not, and whether that's within the scope of his services, um, I would have to let him answer that. <laughs> I am most certainly available and would be happy to work with uh, Mr. Beasley to get this done. <laughs> yes, yay, yay. And while you're up there, I think I speak for all of us. You have been wonderful to work with. Uh, this has been a kind of a long and <laughs> curvy road, but you have always been there for us and you have been unflappable and I appreciate all of your responsiveness to all of us. Well, thank you, that's very kind. Dr. Alexander. Uh, yeah, and this question is for yourself, Madam Chair, and to Mr. Beasley. Uh, in the drafting of this contract, would it be appropriate or some for us to think about it at some point through discussion, Mr. Beasley, 
is inside that contract that there is an evaluation process, a yearly evaluation yeah. that has to be exercised where this board will uh, discuss the and make recommendation, I think, from year to year in terms of their performance. Because I think going forward, uh, we need to have some formal process to measure his success or challenge as we're going to encourage him to do the same thing for all of his senior managers and right on down the line. Thank you. And it's something we have intermittently done, but been a little too sporadic. Uh, Mr. Perkins. Yeah, and that's you know pretty standard in a lot of executive type contracts and there those details I'm sure will be worked out and I'm glad that you know our attorneys getting Mr. Bessinger's input but I also think he needs a contact whether it's the board chairman or the, or the director to um, you know to help pull everything together so I don't know who y'all would like to designate but I think you know in addition to the exterior no. consultation he doesn't want to be out there on a limb by himself with no guidance from someone so either the either the chairman or the director or somebody whoever y'all think but I think he also needs an, an, an you know an, an interior um, connection as well as the exterior Miss Campbell <clears throat> well I, I'm, I'm gonna say one other thing but I I, I believe that needs to be the chairman okay. this, this is yeah to me this is the job of the board um, and and I'd also like to say on that um, the yearly yeah. review I would, I would like that to be done by an outside agency with an outside agency's assistance. There are, there are really good specific performance agencies out there. It's interesting. Uh, and we can discuss that. I, I, yeah. But we certainly, uh, you know. I mean, we would get, have the final. Okay, yeah. yes. Okay. But with the assistance instead of the, like, like in the past it has been through our attorney, I think mm -hmm. that should, that review needs because of the past, I, I would like to see that review done by the board with an outside agency. And we, I, I, I think we can take that up. Uh, yeah, it doesn't need to be not, part of that. That's fine. Um, but I, I, I hear you, I think we all do. I think we're concerned that, that this is something we've kind of stumbled on and we need to do better. Uh, Mr. Beasley. Yes, I just wanted to clarify my, clarify my instructions per my request for logistics. Um, I am to negotiate and with Mr. Woody and take advice from Mr. Benzinger as to the form and function. It is my intent to use the existing executive director contract as a platform for that discussion. I'm also to report to the chair to receive feedback on issues of negotiation. Those will be compensation, benefits, and so forth. And, that, and, and make sure I'm clear on that. And might I ask, I, we made an offer to Ms. Shelton and, and was that comparable to our existing package? I mean, that might be a better benchmark than the existing executive director um, contract. I think hers was higher. Yes, Madam Chair. I believe that the offer components, uh, the ones made to Ms. Sheldon, Sheldon would be appropriate as the composition of the offer. The contract itself is essentially the former contract which we modified for Mr. Johnson which I believe is a is a good platform for the contract there may be components we want to add uh, this review component obviously is is not well stated in the current contract will beef that up but the um, the contract itself is a pretty solid document for purposes of employment yeah. and and we don't have to work out all those details here right. we're, we're encouraging y'all to get that and bring it back to us yeah. Uh, Mr. Benzinger, did you want to address us? I just wanted to thank everybody. You've been wonderful to work with, your staff, the board, everybody. Uh, it's been a lengthy process, but I've enjoyed it. <laughs> just a little long. So thank you, please, and I wanted to express that. Well, thank you. We're going to miss seeing you. <laughs> Hopefully we'll never see you again. Right. <laughs> Uh, now we have open forum. Uh, we if, and do, do we have anyone signed up for open forum? Okay. In that case, it's been a long one. We are adjourned. Thank you all for all you did.